the advantage of these protocols is kind of a mixed bag because on the one hand, they have good features, which I will describe later, uh, but there's a problem in that some of the participants not having adopted or no longer accepting these protocols. So uh, the, the things are a bit up in the air. Ukraine is a party to the AP1, dealing with nuclear power plants. Russia once was a party, but Putin pulled out in 2019. He uh, claimed that uh, it was unfair to Russia. The United States signed the AP1 in 1977, which is when it was put forth, but never ratified it. And uh, I'll explain some of the reasons, or I'll quote some of the reasons. Uh, let me just mention that if a treaty signature is subject to ratification to complete the process, it does not itself establish consent to be bound by the by the treaty. It does, it's generally agreed, create an obligation to refrain uh, in good faith from acts that would defeat the purpose of the treaty, but it doesn't, you're not bound by it if you've only signed it. Um, altogether, an overwhelming majority of countries have ratified, and I'll, I'll show you a map later uh, with, with, with all the ones that have and haven't. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this, this is actually more or less quoted from the additional protocol. And it has about a hundred articles uh, and several of them deal with the subject we're talking about. And article 48, which I believe is entitled basic rule, says uh, it, in order to respect ensure respect for and protection of the civilian population and civilian objects, which is kind of the aim of all these treaties. The parties to the conflict shall at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants. And the same thing for facilities, between civilian facilities and military objectives. And accordingly shall direct their operations only at military objectives. Now, obviously there's a certain amount of imprecision here, but this is the objective. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is important. It says, in case of doubt whether a person is a civilian, that person shall be considered to be a civilian. Uh, and another important point is in number three, the presence within the civilian population of individuals who do not come within the def definition of civilians, in other words, military or whatever, uh, but, but a combatant, does not deprive the population of its civilian character. So in other words, what, what this treaty is saying is that you can't a attack a crowd of civilians because within it, there are some combatants. Now, that's pretty important. Uh, next slide, please. Now, that's not the view of the United States at the present time. Uh, the picture there is the, is the front, is the cover of the Department of Defense Law, Law of War Manual, which uh, I've just uh, learned about it this early, recently. Some of you in the military may be familiar with it. It's a great fat book. Uh, and it deals, among other things, with this uh, international treaty. And it says uh, that that distinction that I just mentioned, which is in the treaty uh, between combatants and combatants and how you interpret it if there is doubt, uh, what the law of war manual says, under customary international law, no legal presumption of civil status exists for persons or objects, nor is there any rule inhibiting commanders or other military personnel from acting based on the information available to him or her in doubtful cases. 
So it's left up to the commanders. Um, you can understand this point of view, and at the same time, the question remains, do we want to leave it this way, or do we want to join with many other countries in putting a, a harder prohibition on, on, uh, on uh, dealing, interpreting doubtful cases to be uh, facilities to be warlike or, or individuals to be combatants? 